Peter Tofatafua, welcome to Between Two Beers. Ah, it's a it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here amongst uh, amongst you legends. <laughs> we did briefly contemplate starting this episode with both of our shirts off um, to sort of put you at ease a little bit. We thought it would be quite a good gag. Uh, decided against it. Yeah, it's probably for the best. Probably, probably the right call. Uh, where are you coming from, Peter? Where in the world are you at the moment? Uh, I'm I'm over in Brisbane at the moment. It's a uh, it's it was it's meant to be coming into spring, but all of a sudden we've had this this cold kind of uh, front come through. So it's you know, but but for me, cold isn't cold. I probably isn't cold for most people. That's why I've got my jacket on. But uh, yeah, sunny Brisbane. Nice. Uh, the way we like to start things between two beers is we tell the guests how we know the guest. So Shay, how do you know Peter? Well, um, I was lucky enough to be in Port Moresby when he qualified for his first Olympic Games. I was maybe part of a cheering squad of five. I think Nathaniel Lapani, who's a friend of the show, he's a, a Patreon. Um, I know he'll be tuning into this. I think you and him might have gone to school together um, in Brisbane. Um, and he said to me, hey, a friend of mine is coming over for Taekwondo. Let's go and watch him. Um, so I met, I was lucky enough to meet Peter there. I was one of maybe millions that, uh, popped an Instagram <laughs> photo on after Rio and didn't get a response, but that's cool. Um, and we, yeah, we caught up, uh, in Samoa at the Pacific games, um, uh, a couple of years ago, very, very briefly, but look, it, it's really nice to see, um, his smiling face. We had a brief, um, a couple of days in Port Moresby and um, really struck a chord with me. It's stuck with me ever since, so really ha happy to have you on. But, Stephen, um, you're probably a little bit new to, to Peter and his story. Well, I, like everyone else in the world, I was aware of the hot Tongan flag bearer who sort of captured the Internet's attention uh, five years ago. But it wasn't, as we tend to do in these Between Two Beers episodes, uh, when we do a deep dive into the guest, the stuff I've learned over the last 48 hours about the rest of your story has been truly incredible. And I'm going to read just a little excerpt. This guy, Henry Bushnell, uh, wrote this really great profile of you from Yahoo. Uh, I just want to read the start of it, which sort of paints a, a nice picture. He says, in the five years since his bare, oily chest made him an instant Olympic sensation, Peter Tofatafua, the shirtless Tongan flag bearer, has been busy. He picked up an entirely foreign sport, cross-country skiing, learned it via YouTube in 5 a.m. roller skiing sessions, hopped to a dozen countries in eight weeks, ran up $40,000 in credit card debt, drove through an Icelandic snowstorm to reach an Arctic fjord, and on the last day possible, qualified for the Winter Olympics. He went shirtless again in Pyeongchang, despite freezing temps, and on late night TV shows in between Olympics. He wrote a book, schmoozed with Prince Harry, worked for UNICEF, visited the United Nations, and spoke at MIT alongside Justin Trudeau. Then he picked up a third sport, kayak, tried to qualify for a third consecutive Olympics, failed, but fought through a broken rib to qualify for Tokyo in his original sport. Taekwondo. So for our listeners <laughs> who didn't know your story, and I have to admit, I like I said, I've only learned the majority of that in the last 48 hours. There's a hell of a lot to unpack, and we are going to get to it. But we want to begin at the 24 hours post Rio opening ceremony, because like we sort of briefly mentioned, you, you established a level of viral shirtless fame, perhaps unrivaled by anything on the internet at the time. This thing was enormous, worldwide, everywhere, all-consuming, hundreds of millions of tweets, stories, posts, likes. Seamus was one of them. <laughs> uh, you got shirtless, you got oiled up, you wore the traditional tongue and outfit, and everyone went crazy. But everyone knows a lot about that, I think. But we want to focus in on what happened next. So can you tell us... A little bit about the next 24 hours after that opening ceremony uh it, it was quite funny because after the opening ceremony at the time there was no hot water in the uh, village <laughs> and when you're covered in that much oil and there's no hot water to wash it off um you spend 24 hours trying to find ways to uh, no on a serious note when i when i walked out i guess at the opening ceremony I walked out somewhat of a, 
somewhat of a, I'm about to use the wrong word. I was going to say virgin, but <laughs> probably a different. Yeah, maybe you were. That's fine. Your business is your business. <laughs> um, no, somewhat of a, a noob to, you know, to the whole scene of, of what it was like. So I walked out and then five minutes later, an athlete comes up to me and says, you're trending in, in every country around the world. And I said, ah, cool, what does trending mean, right? At, at this stage, I didn't even, I was completely new to the whole, I was on social media, but I didn't understand what it actually meant, you know, the, the, the depth of how far it can go, right? Um, and then over the next 24 hours, I was just getting, uh, you know, a whole lot of messages people were offering to become managers and and it, it was just it was quite crazy and um and and what you had said before Seamus was about the you know not replying to a message it's what a lot of people didn't quite understand and it was it was new to me as well right like this was completely new to me was that a message comes in and then within an hour it's it's 400 down right um and then and the reason I say that is not to gloat, but because it actually, it, it, I learned a valuable lesson in that 24 hours. Uh, there was a very close friend of, of mine um, and, and Nathaniel's as well, a guy called Vaughn Boucher. Uh, so I went to school with him at the time and he had messaged me and I briefly just seen his message. He was offering some help. He said, Peter, things are going to get really crazy for you. I, I know someone who can, who can help in the arena, uh, someone I trust. And because there was so much happening, I just looked at it, I kind of smiled and I, you know, and, I, and, and I kept on going. I didn't, I, didn't have, I didn't respond to it. And the reason I bring that story up, and I don't want to go kind of into the, I don't want to go to this place straight away, but it was, it, was, it was a lesson that I learned then, was two months later, that friend passed away, right? Um, and I, I didn't know at the time that he had had actually had cancer. And so I learned a very valuable lesson in the first, uh, not 24 hours, but in the first two months of being viral that, um, you know, you there are people that were always there for you. Respond, be human, right? Don't get caught up in the, in the wave of, of what was happening. It was so new to me that I was taken away in a, you know, in a wave of things. And then I, you know, I didn't get to say goodbye to a, to a good friend. Right. And I wasn't, I wasn't even aware that this guy was, was sick at the time. Um, so I don't know if that answers the 24 hour question, but it kind of, I went on a tangent with it, but that 24 hours was just crazy for me. It was just offer after offer, after interview, after interview. Um, and I wasn't prepared for it. I, I a hundred percent was not prepared for what uh, what was coming my way in, in that 24 hours, in that seven days. On a more specific level, what does your phone, like, is your phone still operable? Like, are there too many messages coming in that you just, there's no use for it? Do you need to get a manager or someone or an agent or a team to look after it? Like, what does it actually look like? I, I do have a manager at the moment, um, and it's quite funny because my manager is... Uh, is worlds apart in terms of how we were brought up. He, his grandfather founded NBC Studios. He's from Hollywood. I'm from Tonga, right? Um, but around the, you know, especially around the Olympic team, uh, Olympic time, it's I have to, you know, me, I have to flick messages off to people to to respond and, and to kind of bet what's what, what's, um, you know, what is I guess what are the opportunities? Where you know where can I best put my energy to help the most amount of people or where's an opportunity that can help me then help more people if that makes sense so it um it really depends which part of the year or how close to the olympics or what's happening in my life at the time as to as to what's happening on uh, phone wise so to, to jump back to to that situation in rio then it's your first time competing at the olympics and this is this has happened prior to you. I think you competed on the last day of competition. Is that right? Yes, yes. So you've almost got two weeks to weather the storm and then prepare for what you've been preparing for, for for 20 years. So how much of a distraction is that 
in terms of your um, your preparation for your competition? Uh, it was a complete distraction. I had like, whoa, how do you even prepare for that, right? How do you prepare for hundreds of millions of Google searches? Where is Tonga? Who is the Tongan flag bearer? Message, like, and, and even things that were coming in from family, I, it was quite hard for me to vet that kind of stuff as well. And I was trying to be aware, but um, only because it was so new mm. to me at that time, I had no idea what, what it all meant. I was prepared to fight on the last day until that happened. And then that happened. And then, you know, I'm being thrown at interviews, going to all different places, meeting different people. Uh, it, it wasn't ideal, but it also wasn't the reason I lost to the world champion either, right? It's not an excuse. It's a, it was just a scenario which I, I wasn't prepared for. I always love the, the granular insight of this insane thing has happened where the whole world is taking notice of you. And you try to process that and you go to sleep that night. And then the next morning you wake up however long it takes you to get to sleep and you wake up and you kind of break out of your slumber and you're like, oh, shit, yeah, that happened. <laughs> like, does it, did it come crashing back to you in the morning when you woke up? It, it did. And, and I actually didn't get much sleep that night because I was, I, I mean, there was, there was a level. What's that? Your phone would have been buzzing for that whole time as well. I, I, well, I, I've learned since, right? I've learned since. I these days I don't even have my phone on. Uh, uh, it's it's completely off. I get no. I get zero notifications. I only go onto my phone to actually to seek out if my family's how my family is. I, I don't actually let it distract me. Wow. But at the time, right? It's it's going nonstop, and um, I didn't get much sleep that night. I didn't get much sleep. I was excited. I was nervous. Uh, just a whole lot of emotions were, were running through my head at the time. I didn't know what it was going to look like in the morning. Um, and then to, to gain, again, to drill down, so for the benefit of, of people that haven't been lucky enough to be to, to attend an Olympics, and I've, I've gone to one in 2012 as a support staff member, you go to probably the... Um, the canteen right in the morning to get some breakfast so you've woken up your phone's going crazy you walk into the canteen to have something are you immediately getting requests for photos from other athletes and people as well uh non-stop non-stop that whole two weeks was i couldn't go anywhere um i i only left the olympic village uh twice and that was uh, that was with uh, that was with security, with uh, entourage, not not of my own choice, right? Like I didn't I didn't even know what an entourage was, um, <laughs> and that was to go to different interviews, to go to different uh, different things. Uh, but from from the moment I left the building, you know, even getting in the lifts, it was just photo, 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 and at the time where I'd come from. You don't say no to people, right? You don't. You don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be the guy who someone wants a photo. It's it, or or to say something to you. It's special for them, right? In that moment, it's special for them. So you don't want to be the guy who's like, no, I just want to go and eat. And what that meant was that it was just you know the the walk to the bus, the walk to the cafeteria, the walk to. Uh, wherever we were going was just constant stop, start, stop, start. And all it takes is one or two people to start taking a photo. And then you've got six, seven, eight more athletes kind of lining up behind them, wanting, you know, and it's 15 minutes later before you get to move on from that group, right? Um, and I was new to that. I didn't know what that, what that was like, but I also didn't want to say no to anyone. Looking back now, five years later, you know, this happened and then you competed two weeks later. Is there anything you would have done differently or you could have done better across those two weeks? <laughs> uh, great question. Absolutely everything. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, how do you prepare for this, right? Like if you, there were so many, there were so many opportunities. Um, you know, at the time I, at the time, for example, I didn't have a Twitter account, 
right? And when you're trending on a platform, <laughs> you want to be represented on that platform. So, you know, to I, I guess to grow following, etc. But I didn't know that, you know, I didn't know about following. And so it turns out there was a guy with a who ended up being me for about a year <laughs> uh, with a verified tick who wasn't me. Oh, just wow. taking all, you know, taking hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter. Um, and then, I, you know, I eventually put a stop to that and started back at zero. But, you know, I wasn't, if I had all the social media ready, if I had management ready, if I had all that, but in saying that, it's, you know, you learn. Sometimes, sometimes you got to learn on the job. You know, you're thrown in the deep end. And you don't even know you don't even know that you're at a swimming pool. You still think you're, you, you know, you still think you're at home where you're in safari in the in in the tundra or desert or wherever it is. Next thing you're swimming, right? You're in a pool and like, where's my floaty? So, um, pretty much everything. I wasn't ready. It's a bit of a weird one, right? Because you've got this worldwide fame, but it's. I mean, to be honest, it's for the way you look, for your sex appeal to a large extent. Now, I've watched a, a number of, like I said, a, a number of inter interviews and YouTube clips and things, and there was some quite sort of problematic at times ways you were treated by a, a number of sort of female interviewers. Like, there's a few American ones come to mind. And it seemed to me, I thought you actually handled yourself really well. Um, but there, it seemed like a real contrast between sort of being on the meat market to the world and being this sort of this sort of pinup guy to the humility involved with growing up in Tonga and and what I can see in those interviews of you sort of feeling quite uncomfortable with the whole thing. The, I mean the, the way I look at life is there are pro, there's different levels of problems right, and. When you grow up in Tonga with not a whole lot, um, I, I think any kind of Polynesian, any any person from the islands will understand this, right? When you grow up with not much, you really you really understand what a real problem is. So, you know, so so what was happening? Um, you know, you all of a sudden you're a you're a sex symbol, right? And where my family, we laugh at that. Like, that's not even a thing to us, right? It's not even a, that's how I hold myself. It's like, it has no value in our family. You know, if, if for example, you won a genetic lottery or your eyes are equidistant apart or your abs or, or whatever it is, that doesn't have value in, in the way that we think. What has value is how we treat people. So when that all happened, it was, comedic for us it was funny right it was it was hilarious um and then i look at you know so what happened so uh i think there were some hosts they came and they rubbed oil on on me and the way i think about it is i was a guy walking out without a shirt covered in oil right <laughs> it's, it's gonna be it's, it's you know you're, you're kind of putting yourself in some sort of situation not to say that it was right because it wasn't right but i i look at the kid who was born without arms and legs in a slum somewhere and i go that's a real problem that's real difficulty who am i to who am i to sit back and uh complain about anything that's going on in my life right i so I don't complain about I don't complain about those things. I laugh them off. I uh, say there was a female. Men went up and started, you know, doing their thing. Right. Um, that would be probably more inappropriate, even though it is a double standard, because from a physicality perspective, I'm a six foot two male Polynesian. Right. At any point. I can flick my fingers and, and this is no longer a problem, right? We flip the scenario around and then you put, a, a, you know, a young uh, a, a female in that position and there's a real intimidation factor. So 
in terms of the, the sex appeal stuff, I just found it all funny. I didn't take too much of it seriously. But um, it, it, that was a good question because I've been asked that a, a, I've been asked that once or twice, um, and I haven't really gone into depth about it. But um, I just wanted people to know that at any point I could end that interaction if you know if it became too much or. But because of our you know Polynesian roots, we just we don't want to we don't wanna, we don't want other people to lose face either. So. Peter, take us back to growing up in Tonga. You, you've kind of referenced it earlier there. I've got a reference point, my mum from the Solomon Islands, of as a kid visiting and, and you know, you you go there and there's no running, you, you know, you come from New Zealand, there's no running water, there's no electricity, you're playing cards by a kerosene lamp. Um, it does give you a unique perspective when you when you kind of re-enter the Western world for, for a, a degree. So... That upbringing, how has that kind of influenced your thinking now? In in, in so many ways. So I, you know, I attribute uh, a lot of what I do now to two things: one, growing up in Tonga; two, working in youth homeless shelters. But you know, as you said, growing up in Tonga, kerosene lamps, you know, um, toilet, dugout toilets, uh, electricity sometimes on Saturday, right? when the island doesn't run out of fuel and if you've got electricity hooked up or a cyclone hasn't taken it out water you know water pressure basically non-existent you know carting buckets of water from the um, you know from the rainwater tank that at the time to me was normal i didn't look at others and say i wish i had that it was just that was that's what we had and then and the great thing about that is that when now all of a sudden you're put into a you're put into an atmosphere where all of a sudden you have stuff, right? You have access to stuff. Um, you value it a little bit more. You value it because you didn't have much. But in saying that, you value stuff, but you. But you value people. You know, this is a this is a Polynesian thing. When when people say, "What do Polynesians, what the islanders bring to the world?" We value people above you know above and beyond anything else, and that's the the whole family structure. Our greatest gift I was ever given growing up was family. That's one hundred percent a big family. Family with not much, but a big family. Yeah, let's let's zero in so lessons from your parents because i know they're big influences in your life so your father for those that, that don't know um is tongan and your mother was australian so you're you're mixed race growing up in tonga but what are some of the lessons that both sides of of that heritage um have taught you uh greatest lesson from my mother was that uh we can achieve anything it, it didn't matter what what happened in life and how many failures we went through as kids my mother always said that we can achieve anything and when you hear that message enough you start to believe it right and it's coming from someone you know your mother and you hear it for years and years you you know what you know what son you can achieve anything that you put your mind to and i i started to believe it i started to believe what my mother had told me my father's lesson is more along the lines of of humility uh, a couple of years ago, I I was invited to meet uh, Prince Harry and, and Meghan. I'm not sure if it's still Prince Harry and Meghan. I was in, invited <laughs> to meet the uh, the royal couple. I get off the airplane and my father picks me up, and I, I'm like, okay, I've got to go get my my outfit ready and you know prepare prepare for this big event. He gets me off the airplane and he takes me to the farm. You know, our suitcases are still in the back, takes me to the farm, and we spend hours over a well with buckets, pulling up water, taking this bull and this cow from this coconut tree to that one, bringing them over to drink at the, at the, at the old bathtub. Um, and I said, you know, we've got to go and do this. He said, none of that matters. First, we have, we have work that needs to be done first. And 
this is after Rio, right? This is, um, you know, I'm somewhat of a someone. If that, everyone's a someone, but in, in terms of the, uh, you know, I, 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 I had now had access to more people. Let me put it that way. I could access more people in, in, all, in all circles, right? Um, and my father, he had to make sure that I didn't start flying away, that I didn't become Icarus flying towards the sun and then having my wings burn off, right? So that's the lesson from my father is remain humble. Remain, remember where you, remember where you come from before any of the other stuff and you'll always be on the right path. I've heard a, a great line you've used um, to get to Rio was uh, 20 years of work and 30 seconds of shine or something like that. Um, you've, you've talked about some of the, the strength of overcoming failures. I know there were a number of them across those 20 years. What, what were the hardest parts of that journey to get to Rio? Uh, the hardest parts, and maybe this is probably what some listeners don't quite realize is the qualification process. Every four years, we get one day. And Seamus, you were there on that day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's every four years, we get one day to win Oceania, to be the number one in the, in the region, right? If you got a cold or a flu on that day or you had a bad sleep, then guess what? You've got to wait another four years and then another four. All of a sudden, it's eight, 12 years, right? Mm. Um, and 2008... I got silver at the qualifier. I left New Caledonia in a wheelchair because I, I fractured my foot and, and twisted my ankle in the final. I, I came second. Wait four years. Go back to New Caledonia. I get to the final. Same thing, silver. This time I left on crutches, right? I, I tore a knee ligament. Wait another four years. I end up in Papua New Guinea. What changed in Papua New Guinea was my mindset was completely different to the last, you know, the, the last two times. So going back to the actual question, injury, 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 you know, I was, I, I, I've broken more, I don't even know the names of the bones I've broken, torn ligaments. Um, I think when I did the calculation, I spent over a year and a half on crutches six months in a wheelchair of my life right in trying to achieve this every last dollar that i ever had went on trying to qualify for the olympics um relationship breakdowns you know there's when when you believe that you can achieve something and you're in an intimate relationship with uh with a partner and 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 they don't believe they don't see the vision then you know it, it leads to um Mis mismatched direction so then there was relationship breakdowns um so i sacrificed sacrificed the whole lot and i do it a hundred times over mm -hmm. i do it a hundred times over because what is life without purpose what is life without without a, a path with dragons that we have to overcome and if if we aren't on the path of life where we're trying to overcome dragons then God or the universe in their infinite wisdom will give us internal dragons to overcome. So, I, I yeah, I would do it a hundred times over. The, um, like you, you've, you've condensed it really, really well. Um, it is, it, and it actually, I think your Olympic, your, your kind of Olympic journey, like in terms of the actual qualifying, it started even Athens 2004, right? Where you, yeah. You weren't able to even attend the qualifiers. Yeah, no money. <laughs> yeah. So so you've got 2004 Athens, you've got 2008 Beijing, 2012 London. So that's that's three three Olympics you miss out on. But if we go right back, that mm -hmm. Olympic torch for you was first ignited in 1996. Yes. And that was through Pia Wolfgram, who uh, Tongan boxer who who got uh, silver, I think, in Atlanta. Yes, and yes. So he returns to Tonga a hero? He returns to Tonga a hero. I'm in school at the time. I'm in Tonga side school. And 
he comes back the, the, the first and only ever medal from the Olympics as a silver medal boxer. We stand, we line the, we line the streets and we're all holding up signs. And I had, this, I had the letter P for Paya. And the person next to me, the kid next to me had A and then E and then A. And he drives past and he waves. And I think he was waving at, I thought he was waving at me. He was probably waving at everyone. <laughs> and that was the moment, right? I said, that's it. This is 1996. I'm still a kid in Thomas High School. I, um, I'm going to be an Olympian. I'm going to be the first Taekwondo Olympian. To, and and then... I'll, I'll jump in. I, I just I think that the, the fact that that is lit at 12 and then it just sticks with you. And despite those setbacks, you, you still pursued it. Like that, that perseverance is incredible. Uh, per perseverance, tenacity, and it's, it's when you set your mind on something that you believe is a worthy goal, then there's nothing that there's nothing that should move you off that path, right? And you mix this up with with the voice in my ear from my mother that you can achieve anything that you want to achieve. Unfortunately for me at the time, I'm also the the smallest kid in my grade, and I don't say that uh, uh, you know figuratively. I was a, the smallest boy in my grade. I, I measured the, the second smallest was a guy called Thaya, right? So we are, with, I'm physically not where everyone, everyone else was growing up in Tonga. Everyone else is, is bigger than me. I go to school for four years, Tonga side school, Tonga high school, four years. I never miss a rugby training. I was doing rugby at the same time, right? I, everyone's doing rugby when you're in the island. I never missed the rugby uh, training for four years, and, and the coach never once put me on the field. I never once ran on the rugby field in Tonga. Four years, never missed a training session. It's carrying oranges to the boys. They wouldn't, uh, not even in the dying minutes of a winning or a losing game, would they put me on. Like, that's, that's the physicality that the, the coach thought. He thought I'd probably get broken, right? or that something bad would happen to me. And this is at the same time that I'm thinking I'm going to be an Olympian. So you have an incongruence between where you are physically and where your mind thinks or believes you're meant to be, right? There's this battle. But ultimately, spirit leads mind, mind leads body. Body just had to eventually catch up. Like, I'm, I'm kind of aware, I don't know if it's tongue-in-cheek, but, you know, post-Rio, mm -hmm. you know, you've, you've spoken about requests and offers and things like, it, surely there's a movie or something in the works, right? Like, <laughs> based on your story, like, I, you know, I'd, lo I'd love to call bullshit on some of these things that happen, but they, they actually happen. So, you know, is that is that something that is a real thing or is that like... We, a, we've been offered, uh, we've been off, I, we've been offered so much. And I think a lot of people will kind of balk at the at the things that we've actually turned down, right? Some of the some of the opportunities that we've turned down. There was a you know, there was a multi million dollar documentary, um, just about my life, right? Peter, we're going to give you we're going to give you this much. This is a retainer, um, and it was it was over a mil for me, right? And this is coming from a guy who had nothing, like at the time. I had finished an Olympic and I was I was 40k in debt, right? And it's like, you know, people saw how interesting the story was of, of, of qualifying for the Olympics, and they're like, here's a and we and we were made an offer. This is from Hollywood. And I read the terms and I spoke to my manager and I said, No. He said, Why? This is a this is a lot of money. I said, Because of this line here. He said, What's the line? And I said, uh, you, you, you sign to give off all of your rights to your story away to the, to the production company, right? And what that meant to me was that the narrative of my life was now theirs. I couldn't go and, 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 and challenge that. And what's, you know, what's, what's your life worth? We were coming from, we were coming from the negotiation process of, 
let's work together. They were coming from the negotiation process of we're going to take what you have and we're going to, we're going to twist it however we want to sell mm. seats in, 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 in cinemas, right? Um, or in, you know, wherever it was going, Netflix, Hulu, or wherever, wherever that was. And the money meant nothing to me because I didn't want my, I didn't want my story to be, you know, uh, changed. I, I, I wanted, I wanted it to be true. I wanted it to be, um, I wanted it to represent who I was. I didn't want to sign away those things. So that was one deal. There've been multiple deals. Uh, some have gone through. Some we've, you know, we've decided not to. But uh, yeah, we've, I've put myself in a in in a very good place. And there's there is uh, there is a there is a film on the on the way. Uh, but that's probably early to mid next year. We'll start uh, start shooting. So. If I can, uh, can I just um, can I request that I play myself in the scene <laughs> in when the scene's recreated in Port Moresby? I just like to put myself in the script there to play myself in the crowd if we, that's possible. We uh, well, this one isn't a documentary, but when that happens, we absolutely have to have you there because uh, there were there were only a couple of voices that I could hear in that stadium, and it was uh, uh, yours and, and Nathaniel. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think, Peter, I think I heard you say that at one point after Rio, you were getting something like 500 offers a day. You've talked about some of the big ones, but I think perhaps this is the most interesting part of the journey for me is your decision to, and I'm not sure if this is right, to basically turn a blind eye to most, if not all of those, and then instead take up a whole new sport in a quest to make a, a different Olympics and a different sport. Is that how it worked? Did you did you walk away from all of those offers to train? Or did, did you, like you said, did you pick up a few bits and pieces just to keep yourself financial? Or how did that, how did that process work? The, I, I, I gave up everything to train. <clears throat> My goal was no one's ever done a summer winter Olympics in Taekwondo and, and Tonga, no one's ever qualified in skiing for Tonga. I'm going to be the first, right? And then, so I then had a one-track mind as to, you know, the how many people have done summer, winter, and and, and qualified, right? So, to me, it, it wasn't about the short-term gratification of getting this offer or that offer. God has a plan for me, and I have to follow that plan. And these offers are always going to be there. I, um, you know, there was a show that I was meant to be on. Uh, you guys might know it called the Ellen Ellen Show. And at the time, it was you know pretty big. You know, right now, I don't know. I don't know what the story is with it. Um, <laughs> but you know, we I couldn't couldn't do it. Couldn't do it, right? And and there's a there's a whole lot of things in that basket, and uh, you know it's. One track mind. I have a goal and I need to accomplish it. Nothing's getting in the way in terms of, you know, the, the short term gratification. People said, uh, people were saying, oh, you know, seize, seize that opportunity. You'll never get that again. And I looked at them because this is a common thought. You'll never get the opportunity again. I said, but I'm creating opportunities. I'm creating them by putting myself in really uncomfortable positions. To, to overcome challenges, to now be you know first person in history to do three consecutive Olympics, summer, winter, summer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not comfortable, right? It's not fun. It's, I wouldn't have it any other way, but it's not easy. But, uh, you know, I always saw it as more opportunity comes when you create opportunity and so long as you're willing to to sacrifice and to do what's you know to work hard to overcome your challenges it's not a you know that opportunity doesn't come once and it's like oh no my life's done it's like well i'll just go and do it again just on that specific example the ellen show when someone like that approaches you are they asking you to come on their show and be topless? Like, is it part of the the whole thing is you will do kind of what you're known for? Yeah, it's it's a common request and, and I get it, right? It's a, it's a common request. 
um, the there were there were some there were some things which I, I I don't know how deep I I need to go, but uh, I think with things like that, you always have to put your who you are as a person first and foremost, right? There's a lot of requests that come in, which, which, uh, okay, you go be the monkey and wave the flag and, 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 and do this. Um, and I've turned out a lot of requests because I've made a request where I said, uh, and this isn't, I'm not talking about the Ellen show anymore. I'm talking about other, other, other requests or a lot of other shows. They've said, can you just come on and, wave the flag and cover the oil and i'm like only if i get to talk for at least three minutes about my chosen charity or climate change or what's happening in the pacific and they're like oh the, the show's running like this and and that's not the theme of the day and i said okay i don't need to be on the show right and we're talking big we're talking big shows and again i'm not talking not talking about the ellen show but there are there were other ones which asked me to do things and I, which I wasn't willing to do unless I get to, I'm more than happy to, you know, represent my country, wave the flag, but I'm going to talk about the charities that I, you know, that need the exposure more than I do. I don't need three minutes on a, on a show to get opportunities, but some of these charities do, and I'm going to, I'm going to maximize it, right? I'm going to leverage it for them. Otherwise, you know, the greatest piece of advice, and I'm sorry, I'm going off on the tangent, greatest piece of advice I was ever given was by a man who owned a big, uh, he was a multi-millionaire. He owned uh, steel companies in Australia. And he sat me down. He said, I was 24 at the time. He said, Peter, God will give you anything you ask of him so long as you're willing to give it all back. So long as you're willing to give it all back. If I'm just there, take, take, take for me, I'm going to lose everything, right? So I go, okay, if I get an opportunity to go on a, on a talk show, I'm going to leverage that opportunity to give some light to charities that can't get on that talk show. And it doesn't always work, right? Some, some of them have a different agenda. They want, they want the guy without the shirt, and I'll be that guy if it benefits other people. As long as it gives back to other people, you know, I'll do that. I was going to ask, like, where did that sense of responsibility come from? But you've you've kind of touched on it already there. And I guess, when did that sense of responsibility come? Like, how soon after the Rio experience did you realize, shit, I've got a platform now. I've got <laughs> things that I want to say. Now's my chance to say them. Uh, pretty much straight away. And it, it, I guess it... it I didn't understand the whole platform thing at the time, but a lot of it came from my my parents and from my family who are very much uh, stay humble, right? Go and go and play the role, be the be this, you know, be this guy who's larger than life and doing all these things. But remember where you came from. Stay humble. And um, and 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 it takes me back to you know what I what I had said before where, and I always remembered that lesson, God will give you anything you ask of him. If you give it all back, I was like, Oh, all of a sudden I've got hundreds of thousands of followers, you know, millions of millions of views. I've been given so much. I need to give, I need to start giving back. I, I need to balance my karma. I need to, yeah, it, it, it's hard to explain, but it's like a, I've always thought that you have to stay balanced, right? The more you get, the more you've got to give it all back. Just to follow the, the progression here, and, and for the listeners, when I was researching what you've done, it got a bit confusing at times. There were so many different sports <laughs> popping up and things. So I want to paint a very clear picture. You were you achieved your Olympic dream in Taekwondo, and then after that, decided, from what I understand, to pick the most difficult sport basically that you could find that you'd never done before, which was cross country skiing. 
you learned the techniques from watching YouTube videos of professional races and completed most of your qualification requirements in roller ski races. Is that right? Yes, yes. So uh, I was training out of Brisbane. I, I had a coach over in Germany and I, I spent a couple of months with him. Um, but the, the whole year, the goal was to qualify in a new sport in one year and a sport that I had never, that made no sense, right? I'm 100 kilograms. The average cross country skier is 60. So 40 kilograms lighter than me. Um, it's the highest VO2 max sport, high, you know, higher than a triathlon. Um, it, imagine, imagine if you guys have seen the ski machines, imagine like rowing or paddling and then doing sit ups and running all at the same time for an hour all three body movements for an hour, right? And when I say an hour, you have to remember that out of out of the races which I didn't qualify on the on the snow, out of I think there was close to 15 races, I missed out by 15 seconds in one race on qualifying in an hour long race. 15 seconds. <laughs> like that's what I mean by you can't you can't just stop and be like, I'll just have a breather, right? That's how close I was in one race. So I'm, I'm here in Brisbane doing roller skis in the park. All I had was roller skis. I didn't have snow here. So I'm there training roller skis, and I thought, okay, I've done a year of roller ski training. Um, what are the roller ski races that I can try and qualify in? There were some in Colombia. I did well in those. Then I needed one more to go and qualify on the on the on the snow, and I went to fifteen race uh, fifteen races in I think eight weeks. Uh, I can't remember twelve countries or something like this, and I qualify on the last race of the last day. Right, we pushed through uh, Poland, Turkey, uh, tried for Croatia, Armenia. Right, I'm in Armenia. I had to choose a race, one more race, and I make the Olympics. I'm in Armenia at 3,000 meters above sea level. And I was like, okay, I'll choose the Armenia race over the Croatia race. Maybe the course is easier. Right? I get to the, I get to the Armenia race. I tanked it. Absolute terrible. I passed out on the finish line. My my comrade from Chile comes up and says, "Oh, you should have gone to Croatia." <laughs> right. So we're in Armenia at the time. The Croatia race is that it's it's three o'clock in the afternoon. The Croatia race is the next morning. Armenia is not next to Croatia. I get up and I was like, "I I got to get to Croatia." Right. And I think we have no money at this time. Call my brother. Can you get me a ticket? We spent four hours looking for flights. The only flight was out of Turkey. As it turns out, you can't go through the border between Armenia and Turkey. I find this out in those four hours because it's been shut since 1993. You can't drive through. I was going to drive. I was going to drive like um, like 12 hours to get to Istanbul to fly to Croatia to be there by morning with no sleep. And they said, you can't even get to Turkey. I said, Where can, how do we get there? And there was no other way. And then, and then we looked at every country around Armenia. Oh, it turns out there's a country called Georgia. How far is Georgia? Eight hours away. That moment, uh, can we have a taxi? Right? You have to think every last dollar. This is what people don't realize is we give everything to qualify for the Olympics. I then have an eight-hour taxi ride to Armenia. Uh, to Georgia from Armenia to get a flight to Istanbul to then get to Croatia by next morning. I get off. Um, we, we drive. I thought this guy was going to kill me the way he was like looking at me. I'm in a country I, I know nothing of. End up in Georgia, fly across to Istanbul, running off the plane, pushing through everyone to get to the flight to get to Croatia by um, within the next couple of hours. And guess what? As I get there, they shut the, the, the door on the bridge, aero bridge. Oh, no. 
Now, I've, I've missed a flight before, but not one that I've kind of worked. I worked I had never, I had never missed the flight. They shut it kind of just as I was coming. And so I'm there pressing every button on the keypad at an airport trying to open the door, right? I, was, I lost my mind a little bit. I was like, maybe I'll guess the – but there's a law. The law is, is once that door shuts, you ain't getting on the plane. And I was banging. The lady comes up, and she's like, you can't get in, sir. I was like, I, I've given everything. You don't know how much I have to be on that plane. She said, sorry. I'm now sitting in Istanbul. I couldn't afford any more flight. I, I was stuck in Istanbul. What's that feeling? What's that feeling like right at that moment? I, I didn't know how I was going to get home, right? I didn't know how I was going to get anywhere. I had given everything to try to get to these races. All I needed was one out of 15 to qualify. And I went, went to them all, gave everything. My heart sunk a little bit. And, but um, there's a peace in it. I feel, I feel peace, not when I'm in difficult times, but when I know that I've given everything to try to achieve a dream. I'm sitting there, there's a picture of me sitting there, leaning back with my feet up on the chair going stuck in Istanbul. I then get messages from people all around the world offering to, you know, to try and help me get somewhere. And my brother calls me and says, I can get you, I can get you to London on points. Just wait there. I waited there. I fly to London on points. Two days later, last race of the last days in Iceland. Right? And that's a whole different story that was meant to be a movie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, so that's, that's an epic tale, right? That's that's a well documented epic tale mm -hmm. of snowstorms and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, absolutely, and and that's like the whole part, the whole all the all those races just to even get to that point. From the moment I was roller skiing here, from like remember, this is one year, new sport, hard, sport, very hard sport to reach Olympic level qualification. I can't just be the best in Tonga. You have to remember that I've, I've qualified for every everything and I've it's been very hard, but you have to meet the Olympic level qualification, not just be the best in Tonga, because otherwise I'd be in any, well, no, not any sport, but in, in a whole lot more sports, maybe ones that there's no one in. I love that there's so much to your story. I know the Iceland story, and it's an absolute cracker, but you're kind of considering glossing over it because we've just told another epic story. But I just before we do get to it, because I do want to hear about it, um, when you're on this journey of cross-country skiing, do you have unanimous support from all of your countrymen and friends and family and supporters? Or is there a percentage of them that are kind of confused or just not on board with this whole idea or think you're crazy like what's the what's the ratio looking like yeah how many cool runnings references are they thrown about in uh, that too, too many oh. too many to remember the it's it's somewhat of a you have to go through a lot of criticism to get to these positions um when you say you're going to qualify in a new sport, cross-country skiing in a year, like you open yourself up to be absolutely destroyed. The second you have a, a bad race, which was all of them, up to the qualification races, you, you, you're now a headline, right? Peter Flunks, um, you know, should be focusing on one sport. No way he'll ever qualify. And then you get a, and then you get like a, a you know, someone, the, the world champion. In, in cross country skiing, who goes and says, This guy should stick to putting on oil. There's no, uh, he'll never qualify for the Olympics. A, a, a Norwegian man, right? Uh, he'll never qualify for the Olympics. No chance. Stick to oil. That's all you're good at, right? That's what he writes on his Twitter story. It makes a headline, right? For, for him. Turns out he didn't qualify. I mean, obviously. Obviously, Norway, it's harder to be number one, but, you know, there's some poetic justice in that. And I came from a place where we just encourage people. You want to go and do cross-country skiing? Man, that's crazy, but that's exciting as well. So I opened myself up to so much criticism. But at that point, 
people under uh, the people that I actually cared about, they knew that. I don't know how Peter does it, but he finds a way, right? He he pushes till he. So they know the craziness involved, and they don't question it anymore. <laughs> they just <laughs> laugh, right? They just <laughs> sit back and laugh. But um, yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, there was a whole lot of. Um, uh, Percentage-wise, majority of people that kind of follow the story were, were positive, but I also know that in the back of their mind, they were thinking uh, it's not going to happen. We, we need to close the loop. Uh, give it as much or as little detail as you want, but tell us about Iceland. Tell us about how you did qualify. <laughs> so 15 races, however many, 12 countries, eight weeks. Uh, missed out by 15 seconds. I'm now in London after missing that flight from Istanbul. I'm at my brother's place. Completely nothing left. I then get a call from my coach in Germany. He said, there's one race. <laughs> uh, but it's on the last day. And it's in Iceland. I said, coach, I, got, I have nothing left. I have one pair of skis. I could only afford one pair of skis. And they were the wrong, you know, the, in skiing, the, the average professional has like 15 pairs, right? Some for cold snow, some for uh, warm snow, dry snow, wet snow, et cetera, et cetera. And the combination of both. I'm in London and I say, I've got to get to this race. So Mexican, a Chilean and a Tongan. And now <laughs> trying to get to Iceland to, to qualify for the Olympics. Yona from Chile had already qualified. Herman and myself hadn't. My brother gives buys me a ticket on points, friend, one way. So we're, we're going to Iceland one way. There's no way out. The race is in the race is in Islia Fjord. We're in a backpacker's place. Three grown men. There's one bed, right? And 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 my brother had my brother had uh, he had hired us a car. We get this hire car. And we couldn't fly to Islia Fjord because there was, there was a big snowstorm and all the flights were canceled. All the roads going to Islia Fjord uh, were snowstormed out. But I said to the boys, I said, guys, we've sacrificed everything to try and qualify. We ain't stopping now, right? We get in this car three days straight. We drive. We found a little town, had a little nap, kept driving. We can only see like a meter and a half, two meters. There's videos on my uh, on my Instagram of what we could see, right? And we call Iceland Roads, and we said, "Can we even get there?" They said, "No." Three avalanches had gone over the road from the snowstorm. So much snow over the road, fell off the mountain, over the road, and into the into the icy water. They blocked the road. I said to the boys, "We're going to drive to the first avalanche." Uh, and I, I talked to Iceland Rose. They said it was 20 kilometers from the first avalanche to the, to the village where the race was. I said, guys, we're going to drive there. We're going to leave the car. It'll probably be gone. Like, we're talking, there's no one. We don't see anybody for uh, 200 kilometers. And then there's a, a village of two people, right? Then there's 200 kilometers. We're going to leave the car. We're going to hike. <laughs> Three days we get there, and then uh, just as we're coming up to that area, 20 kilometers out from the fjord, we saw the the plow in the distance. It had come out maybe half an hour before we got there, and the, the snowstorm had stopped and, and pushed all the uh, cleared the avalanches away. We could still see them on the, you know, where he had pushed it, right? And we sneak on through, sneak on through the road, but we were willing to hike. Uh, it's 10 o'clock at night. We get to the track. And the snow was so soft from all the snowstorm. The guys wanted to go to the, to the hostel. I said, no, we have to go to the track. We get to the track. I put my skis on. And the skis stuck. I had ice skis. And the track was soft snow. I, 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 couldn't, I was like, man, I, if this is what the track is like tomorrow, no chance. I look in the distance, and the, 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 
the, there's a, a tractor coming through that grades the track, that compacts the snow. I stand there and I'm waving. I'm standing in the middle of the track, 10 o'clock at night, on the Arctic Circle, stopping this guy. He gets out of the tractor, of the plow. And he, and he said, how, how can I help you? I said, is there any way? Is there any way that by morning you can have this track <laughs> world-class level? I put, I, I, I put a challenge on him. Is there any way you could have a world-class level? He looks at me and he said one sentence. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> He was a heavier guy, you know, the, the, the fish up that side must have been pretty tasty guy had, had a lot of them. And I said, us heavier guys have to stick together. Is there any way you can have the track world-class level? I'll see what I can do is what he says. I said, thank you, sir. Get back to the hostel um, at 11 o'clock at night, take all of our stuff up, wake up the next morning, we get across to the hard as ice. So this guy must have gone over the track how many times to compact it. And guys, I, I, it's hard for me to explain about the ski thing, but I had that one pair of skis only suited one set of conditions, hard, icy track, uh, warm, dry, right? Warm as in negative four degrees. Dry as in not wet, slushy snow, right? Mm. It was exactly that on that last race of that last day. I put my skis on. Boom. We started the race and I flew. I was like, it's, I, I'm moving. Well, I've never moved like this. On the first hill, Herman falls. And from Mexico, he fell. And... We had, I had spoken to him the night before, and he said, bro, we just, we've got to qualify. Whatever happens, we have to qualify. The Olympic spirit in me says, stop, help him up. The competitor in me says, leave my friend there and get your ass <laughs> around to the finish line. You need to qualify. So I slow down. I look at Herman, and he's, he's off the track, and he's looking at me. He goes, keep going, keep going. I keep going. I gave everything I had. I come up to the finish line, 10 kilometer race. Mind you, I'd, I hadn't, I'd only done one out of the 10 kilometer race. I'd been destroyed in all the 15. This was a 10. Come up to the finish line and I drop. All of a sudden, there's a camera in my face, the Olympic Channel. I don't know how they got there, but they did. Camera in my face. Peter, we think you've done it. I had, I had no, my, my brain was fogging. I said, done what? He said, we think you've qualified. And I was like, I can't even breathe. Let, just give me a few moments. We sat there in the, ca in the little cafeteria dining hall, and they came and they plastered a, a sheet of paper. Peter Tauftafua. Uh, plus five minutes. I was five minutes. I was within five minutes of qualifying. I had qualified with five minutes to spare. Uh, I'd never even made 15 seconds. Expected. Winter Olympian. Would, like that, that, that feeling, does that top the Papua New Guinea feeling or are they very different emotions? Papua New Guinea will always be the greatest because that was 20 years of... of of work it was joy it was bittersweet because her man didn't qualify in that race you can uh you can see why the film companies would be chomping at the bit to get the rights to that it's just me isn't it it's just it's literally a movie um is it right that at the end of this and i'm not sure if my timeline's right that you came out of that broke yourself you were in forty thousand dollars of of credit card debt yep because so in order for me to qualify in one year in that whole year i could do nothing else i couldn't work because one year to make an olympic sport requires everything you have morning 
uh, during the day, afternoon, evening, right? Training, 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 training. I couldn't make money. I couldn't capitalize on the other financial opportunities because I had a dream to be a, you know, a winter Olympian as well. Um, so, yeah, so I was, I credit card everything. And I was in, I was, uh, yeah, I was 40 grand in debt at the end of it. It's, um, but it's, it's not just the financial toll as well, right? Like I understand, did you, was it an auntie that passed away while you were at the Winter Olympics as well? So this, I was this, at the Winter Olympics and my, my auntie, uh, Auntie Sue, like she was so close. Uh, we were such a beautiful, strong lady. Uh, she passed away on the, I was actually at the airport about to fly to, uh, I think I was about to fly to LA at the time. And uh, yeah, I, I was told she passed away. So we, we had two uncles pass away in that year and an auntie. In order for me to even be able to tell these stories, there had to be struggle. But in order to be in a position where, where I am now to be able to even have, you know, uh, uh, people asking you to do a podcast, like it's an honor to be on, you know, to be on your guys' show. But the reason I'm on your show is because of the sacrifice and of overcoming. And I don't want that to be about me, right? None of this is important. I tell the stories about me in order to inspire or help someone listening overcome their that when they see the extremes of what I had to go through, then you know a lot of people message me and they say, maybe I quit too early. Maybe, maybe if I just push through just that little bit more, I can I can achieve. Well, I'm sick and in hospital, but after watching your story, I feel like I feel like there's there's light at the end of the tunnel, right? So that's where I get my value from. That's where I get my enjoyment from is knowing that someone listening or watching uh, your guys' podcast will push just that little bit further. They won't. They will push through the snowstorm, through the avalanches, through the poor conditions. They'll have ice crystals growing on their beard. And that's one of 15 of the, of the races. So that people will push through to accomplish. You know, that, that's how you make the world a better place. You don't go and do these grand grand things that where you make the world a better place you show people or you try to help people become the best version of themselves and then when you've got a million six billion seven billion people all trying to be the best version of themselves then we see real change and that's when that's when shit gets interesting where, where did where did this love of of the narrative of the storytelling come from is it something from your childhood do you have a favorite story that you kind of refer to or is it just like a natural thing that's that's been developed every time i do the myers briggs personality test because i try to trick myself sometimes right but every time i do the test uh it comes out the same way Intro i'm introverted which i think a lot of people find that quite hard to believe but i've had to work I have to work to become, to, to put on the extroverted side of myself, to access that, um, to be able to tell a story, to be animated. You know, I'm, I'm happy to, to stay at home and work on my little projects. And I, you know, I get a lot of joy from that sort of thing, but it doesn't serve a bigger purpose. So I, I didn't, I had to learn how to tell stories, but stories are easy to tell when you've lived them <laughs> because it's you're not telling a story you're accessing a memory we're going to work through to um tokyo but i just want to take a little brief interlude into famous people that you've uh, come across on your journey and one of the interviews i watched was with um snoop dogg and kevin hart you talk about telling your journey like how do you prepare for an interview with snoop dogg it's, ah, uh, Jesus, guys, if I could give you a list of, of really cool people I've met. Um, Snoop Dogg and Kevin. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> We've got time. Don't worry. You can work through all the people. <laughs> it's, uh, I've got a funny story for you after, after this um, about someone I've met. But 
the answer to your question is the same way I, pre I prepare for the interview with you guys. Exactly the same way. The, and, and I think this is one of the reasons I've been able to do okay or to get by in life is that I treat people all equally. From, uh, you know, the, when I go to Thailand, I sit there on the side of the street and I bring a curry to one of the guys. There's a guy I see every time I go, he's got no legs. And I sit there, we have a curry on the side of the street. I sit with him in the gutter, right? And we talk, because he's got interesting stories. And I, and I you know, talk to uh, uh, Hollywood actors. And to me, they're not on different ends of the spectrum. They're just different. But you treat them all the same. And when you treat people all with dignity and respect, it doesn't matter who they are, right? Then I think people are... There, there's a natural attraction in life to people who treat others well in general. So I, you know, how do I prepare for Snoop Dogg and Kevin Hart? Same way I prepare for you guys. I just be myself, nothing more, nothing less. Um, okay, well, give us give us the funny story now. Ah, <laughs> uh, the funny story. Okay, so I'm at the I'm in New York. They fly me across to the Harry Connick Jr. show. Um, I had the, I was getting dressed up in my, this was straight after the Olympics, I was, uh, the first Olympics, I'm getting dressed up in my, my Tongan outfit. And uh, Harry Connick Jr. Is an, is an amazing host. And uh, I was on the show with a few other people. Anyway, I walk and I'm standing at the, I'm standing at the urinal, right? Covered in oil, like you know, a little bit nervous at the time. And I hear this voice in, you know, I hear this voice. Are you a stripper or a dancer? <laughs> you a stripper or a dancer? Like I know that voice, but I didn't want to look and make eye contact with the guy in the in the urinal next to me, right? And I was like, ah. Oh. I turn around and I went, ah. Oh, are you Morgan Freeman? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, yes, I am. And I said to him, I said, well, I'd shake your hand, but uh, I can see it's busy. And we had a little <laughs> chuckle. We had a little chuckle over that. So I'm at, I'm, I meet Morgan Freeman at the, at the urinal of, uh, in, in New York City. I walk outside. He's got an entourage of like 20 people waiting for him. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was yeah, just a funny story how I, uh, how I met Morgan. Just on that Harry Connick Jr., I think that could be one of the worst pronunciations of your surname ever. Yeah. He's he's gone with uh, Toffa Toffa or something like that. It's not a good, Look, he, he, not he a had good a, pronunciation. He had a shot. He, he he took a shot. It's not an yeah. easy uh, not an easy name to uh, to pronounce. And the royal couple, Prince William and, and Meghan, was it more than just the you're standing in a line, you handshake, curtsy, nice to meet you, <laughs> etc. Is there an actual Chance for a genuine exchange, or is it literally yeah, just? I, the I, I can't speak too much of the uh, of, of the royals. They have uh, there's, there's protocols and, and and words which were had had by. So they have a, they have a, a group of people that no one else sees, and they come and they and 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 you talk to them about what can and can't can't be shared from a royal protocol perspective and i'm not very good at following rules but just out of uh i guess just out of respect i'll just uh um i'll just follow what 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 they humbly requested <laughs> and, nice and only because it was humbly requested <laughs> yeah well done well done well played um we've kept you for a while i i just want to do close the loop uh so for those following along at home you started at Taekwondo, you made the Olympics, you went cross-country skiing, and then you decided to attempt to qualify for your third successive Olympics in the new sport of kayaking. Uh, but your journey, it, it didn't end in success. You, you got injured along the way, I think. Uh, but, but you did end up qualifying again for Taekwondo. So if you can sort of summarize that part of the journey, just to, to sort of, uh, yeah, close out the picture there for us <laughs> it's funny each of these is like uh interesting in themselves um when i say interesting what i mean is an absolute nightmare for me in terms of the amount right it's interesting for people 
it seems the more pain I go through, the more interesting a story it is. Mm -hmm. But you know, once I once I had uh, achieved the cross country skiing thing, it was like, uh, let's try and be the first person in history to do three unrelated Olympic sports. Let's try and do two in one Olympics, right? It was just about pushing. How far can we as a human being go to achieve something? Okay, let me try kayaking. Turns out it's, a, it's another very hard sport. Um, <laughs> but I love it. Absolutely. I fell in love with kayaking. But the Oceania qualifiers, I broke I break a rib the week before because I was doing two sprint sessions a day, right? I, I learned from cross-country skiing that the more you do, the better you get quick. But you're also always running on the fence of injury, you know, epic failure versus uh, success. Broke a rib, drive to Sydney anyway, 12 hours to try and qualify. Uh, didn't go to plan. As soon as I put the paddle in, I felt that rib go. That's not to say I would have qualified because the guy who did was, uh, he was actually, he ended up being faster than me, right? Um, COVID hits. Uh, couldn't get to Russia for the last qualification tournament. And I took my paddle to the Olympics. To, I, I don't give up so easily. I hadn't qualified, but I took my paddle and I, I made a, you know, I, I, I wanted to request that they let me, if there's a spare lane, that I will just go and paddle in it. If I can sneak myself in and there's a spare lane, just go and race anyway, right? Turns out it's the Olympics. It's not so easy to do that. But I took my paddle on the chance that it, that I could make it happen. But, uh, you know, the things didn't align and I wasn't able to actually race at the Olympics in kayaking. I had an amazing Tokyo experience in general. I couldn't have wished it to be any better. You know, that's God has his plans. Who am I to, you know, question the... <clears throat> As long as I, you know, the way I see it, as long as we push as hard as we can, that's us asking God or the universe for a chance to achieve something great. We have to actually push, right? And then, um, yeah, didn't didn't exactly go to plan, but whose plan, right? It went it went to someone's plan, so I'm happy uh, regardless. One one of the things that struck a chord with me was. During the Olympics, you you posted on your Instagram. It was a um, an acknowledgement, a, a call out, a shout out around athletes and mental health. Mm -hmm. And then, tragically, a few weeks down the line, one of our Olympians here in New Zealand unfortunately took her own life, Olivia um, Padmore. Um, can you touch on that element um, of being an athlete, of being in the spotlight, the challenges that that also brings as well? This is um, this. There's a few parts that people watching don't always realize, and I think it's cool to bring it to light as well. Is that an athlete? Every athlete is expected by their country to bring back a medal, right? Peter from Tonga, the you know the Tongans expect or want you to bring back a medal. So you got the weight of your country. And in some ways, the weight of the world on your shoulders, because there's other people from other countries as well. But then you've got the guy from Russia, and then you've got, and each one has all of this pressure where you're expected to perform. Um, and then there's only three medals, and 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 not, you know, there's a, a thousands of athletes that don't get a medal. So you have this pressure on you externally. You then have internal pressure that you put on yourself. I need to perform. I don't want to let people down, right? And then, and then all of a sudden, you know, things happen at the Olympics, and yeah, and there's a whole lot of pressure. But what happened in, you know, the case that you were talking about? And I don't know the details, and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to go into the details. It's not my my business. But there's also athletes who have, uh, who maybe they didn't make the Olympics, or maybe. They see others in the Olympics and they, you know, they, I don't know if they, they wanted to be there or things didn't go to plan. This is what an Olympic athlete is like. We have a high and then there's a big drop. 
big, huge drop. And this is a drop that most people will never feel. Because it's not just it's not just the end of a goal, right? To make that Olympics, you sacrifice your whole life to make that one Olympics. It's not just the end of a goal um, because now people feel lost, but it's also you're going from everyone knows you, wants to, is supporting you. You didn't make, uh, you didn't get a medal, or you did. Even you know, there's even athletes who did who go on benders after and and you know, write themselves off, and then drop. That's the perfect recipe for, you know, for mental health challenges for, uh, you know, the, the true test of an athlete isn't the competition, it's after the competition. We don't get, we don't get another season next year. We don't get another game next week to make amends, right? You have a bad game in rugby, oh, we'll give you another shot next week. Right, that's it for four years. If you then make another one, you know you're not too old. So lots of pressure, um, and I love that mental health is now a thing that we're talking about because there's too many people uh, who who feel that being an Olympian means always being strong and not asking for help. And Peter, you, you're a great communicator for that message. Um, throughout the 90 minutes, there's been so many deep, powerful, strong messages that have come through. And I'm, I know it's going to resonate well with our listeners. Uh, talking of plans, there's got to be one. I'm, I'm guessing there there is a, pan, a plan for Paris 2024. Is that oh, Winter Olympics before that? Oh, well, Winter well, Olympics. Olympics. Yes. Yeah, what's, what's um, going on? Uh, a lot of my focus now is on kayaking in terms of, from a sporting perspective. Um, and I also I, I learned early on in the piece that you don't just have one lane going towards an Olympics, one goal. You have multiple goals all happening at the same time, right? So when the, this Olympics ended, I had other things all lined up, ready. So so that there wasn't that drop that I spoke about before. Um, sporting wise, I'm going to put a lot of energy into the kayaking. It's very hard to make an Olympics and, you know, I've um, winter, you know, I'll nev never say never, never say never. But my focus right now is to, I've been, guys, I've been given a lot. I've been given a lot and now I've got to give back. I, I can't just keep going and taking, right? I, I have to, and when I say that, what I actually mean is, one of my dreams is to build free exercise facilities in the Pacific. So starting with Tonga, we're going to build a, a, if any of the listeners out there wanted to help out, there'll be a GoFundMe at some stage in the next couple of weeks. Um, but I wanted to build exercise facilities for the kids in the Pacific so that they always have access, so that money's not a barrier to have access to training. You know, like... Uh, you know, what we had as kids, we didn't even have any of this stuff. Yet Australia, New Zealand, America have them. Can I jump in on that? Because that that theme seems to have carried on through your career now. You, you, you look at some of your stuff that you post, you seem to still make do despite your success. You still seem to make do with stuff that you have around even now. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the things I talk about is uh, resourcefulness is infinitely more beneficial than just resources, right? So we, when you don't have much, you find ways to do a lot with little. Now I've, now I've got access to, you know, a bit more of the resources side, but, um, you know, talking to the, to the listener out there at the moment is I think we can always – find ways to maximize what we do have. And, and this isn't to say when I'm talking about the, the kids in Tonga without equipment, this isn't to say that they can, can't then go, they can't be an Olympic champion without equipment. It's to say, let's actually make it easier for them. Let's create, remove barriers because it's not even about the Olympics. It's about in the Pacific, it's about highlighting a healthier way of living. If kids are training and they put exercise as a value system for them, all of a sudden 
in 20, 30 years time, they don't have heart disease, right? They don't have diabetes. Isn't this a bigger, isn't this bigger than, and, and I actually think this is what the Olympics and being an athlete should all be about, is what you do with it. Man, that's been uh, that's been pretty inspiring stuff, Peter. It's been an incredible tale. Like I said, <laughs> it's to start, you, you know, from the outside, you see this this guy oiled up guy uh, with a shirt off. That the depth and the breadth of the story is insane, uh, and I'm so glad that we've had the chance to unpack it. I mean, there's there's so much left on the table still for a part two. But Shay, anything uh, else we, we need to touch on? The only thing I want to ask is when's the coconut oil line dropping? When is that actually going to come to fruition? Because it's got to be in the works. It, it's funny. I've been asked by basically every coconut comp coconut oil company in the world. Um, there's there's some stuff that we've been working on, you know. As as I said, a lot of my energy was going on doing the Olympics and three in a row kind of thing. So now a lot of my energy is also going into the business side and and into the you know the oil, whether it be oil or, or merchandise or, or all of that sort of thing. Um, what I will say around the I guess the oil and uh, you know what you've mentioned before is that. My mother told me a saying, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. I think maybe it was Mary Poppins. <laughs> um, so I understand that I have a role to play with oil and, and, and shirtlessness and, and that sort of thing. And, but a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? If, if I can use that to help people who are going through difficult times in life in some way, then I'll, you know, I'll take the shirt off and cover myself in oil, uh, you know, when it needs to be done. <laughs> I think that's a, a pretty good place to end. Peter, thank you so much for your time. That's been an absolute joy. Uh, I know the listeners are going to love it. And, yeah, good luck in your journey, and, and we'll, uh, we'll follow it very closely. Excellent. Guys, thank you for having me. Eh? And uh, apologies on... Uh, on the the delayed getting here but uh we we, we made it happen and uh you know i and to all the listeners out there i'm so excited that you guys got to hear this one 90 minutes um but uh yeah it's just an honor to be on uh, to be on your guys podcast cheers peter